What does it mean to be a friend of Israel? I would answer the question this way. Anyone who is a friend of Israel is quite prepared to condone all kinds of behavior which they would almost certainly not approve of if it went on in their own neighborhood. So as to be perfectly clear, this is what the key word in that sentence means. Condone. Forgive or overlook an offense or wrongdoing. Approve or sanction. So what would you do if you saw something like this going on at the end of your street? Why are you arresting the boy? What did the boy do? He's just a would you complain about the cruelty of fully armed members of your police force treating a six-year-old like a fully grown criminal for throwing a few pebbles? Or would you condone it? Or how about a spot of stun gun torture? This 42-year-old Palestinian was repeatedly tasered by an Israeli policeman because he dared to ask that they go easy after they'd used pepper spray on some children. So what do you say? Condone or condemn? Here's one of my favorites, but let me explain the apparent contradiction in terms. It demonstrates so well just how appallingly those who claim to be their God's chosen people behave towards some of his other creations. This started off as one of the weekly peaceful demonstrations against Israel's apartheid war at Nabi Saleh on the 13th of May 2011. Yet it looks as though someone sent an entire battalion of armed policemen and women to break it up. So the question is, would you condone such vicious behavior? Well, for Friends of Israel, that's part of the deal. Love me, love my wall. No, not that one. My apartheid wall. And love my distinctly unloving treatment of my neighbors, who are no better than cattle anyway. But what we've seen so far is pretty tame, compared to the cold-blooded murder of more than 1,400 Palestinians, over 80% of whom were civilians, and 342 were children. This was, of course, the merciless attack on Gaza, about which I made a video. Gaza, in plain language. The sociopathic Zionist administration of Israel, as part of its continuing brutal colonization of Palestine, deliberately devastated the already nearly incapacitated infrastructure which supports the existence of one and a half million refugees. The people of Gaza, second, third and fourth generation dispossessed Palestinians, are living in forced exile from land their families inhabited and cultivated for generations. Financed and armed by the United States, the Israeli military destroyed 15% of the structures in Gaza. Approximately 22,000 buildings, including 5,300 housing units, destroyed or subject to major damage. Another 52,000 homes receive some form of structural damage. Over 200 factories and 700 stores and businesses were destroyed or badly damaged. Of the residences, factories and businesses completely destroyed, 1,300 of the homes and approximately 25% of the commercial property were deliberately and painstakingly bulldozed or exploded by Israeli ground forces. Eight hospitals and 26 primary health care clinics were damaged or destroyed. More than 280 schools were damaged or destroyed. Water and sewage treatment facilities, as well as electricity infrastructure, were deliberately targeted, leaving vast segments of the population with little or no power or clean water for the duration of the assault and for weeks and months to follow. Massive amounts of agricultural lands were systematically bombed or bulldozed. When the Israelis invaded the Gaza Strip, they came straight in here. I've covered earthquakes, hurricanes and the tsunami. And what has happened here is as bad or worse than anything I've seen in any of those. And this was done by Israeli bulldozers. So what say you, friends of Israel? Do you really condone this kind of thing? And what about this for a bit of bald-faced hypocrisy? We are trying to avoid any kind of civil casualties. Zaitun, also flattened by Israeli bulldozers. 
but in this house they'd herded 100 members of the Samuni clan and then they shelled it, killing 49 of them. We are trying to avoid any kind of civil casualties. Neither Ms. Livney nor her fellow war criminals could have possibly known that the white phosphorus they approved to be dropped on Gaza would not cause any civil casualties. Of course they couldn't, and of course it did. This little fellow was one of the lucky ones. He wasn't killed. Before I go any further, let me ask, have you seen anything so far which would tempt you to become a friend of Israel? Anyone who answered yes would be in good company because one of the most renowned broadcasters on the planet, the British Broadcasting Corporation, is one of the best friends that Israel has. For example, the title of one of the BBC's Panorama documentaries broadcast on Sunday the 22nd of August 2010 should have been something like The Targeted Assassinations of Nine Unarmed Men in International Waters by Israeli Commandos. But the BBC's spin doctors turned that down just a little and came up with death in the med. I've already made a video about this, but here are some rather telling highlights. The first helicopter hovered over the top deck of the ship. The commandos inside were armed with non-lethal weapons, paintball and stun guns. But each man also had a pistol. She's got to be kidding, right? An experienced BBC documentary maker tells us that these Israeli commandos were armed with non-lethal weapons, but that but each man also had a pistol. Although Miss Corbyn doesn't mention the fact, these pistols were definitely lethal. And out of a multitude of nationalities aboard the Mavi Marmara, these nine men, all Turkish, were selectively murdered. 19-year-old Furkan Dogan, a U.S. citizen of Turkish descent, was shot once in the chest and four times in the head. But to lighten things up a bit, we've just got time for another Corbin comic cut. Here she visits one of the organizers of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, Bulent Yildirim. You said that if they, the Israelis, board the ship, we will throw them into the sea. Isn't that a provocation to be saying that to your followers on the ship? No, Mr. Yildirim is not speechless, although he should have been. I've frozen the frame. Doesn't Jane Corbyn understand that the provocation came from a bunch of Israeli commandos boarding his ship at 3 a.m. in international waters? But she's far from provocative herself, which is what any half-decent documentary maker should be, especially when discussing things with an Israeli spokesperson. We have a very clear evidence that at least in four cases the other side did use live fire in some of them they did use the israeli weapons that was stolen from our soldiers but at least in one case they did use their weapon because we found bullets and shells of weapons that is not in use in the israeli forces i have not cut this part of the video that is all the retired major general said so i can only guess that either Jane Corbyn did not ask if she could see the evidence of that one case where a non-Israeli weapon was used, or that the Major General declined to show it to her. But what Jane Corbyn seemed very confident about, even before getting her material back to the panorama cutting room, was that she knew the motive behind the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, of which the Mavi Marmara was the flagship. At the end of the day, the bid to break the naval blockade wasn't really about bringing aid to Gaza. It was a political move designed to put pressure on Israel and the international community. And Jane Corbyn is no stranger to political motives. Her late husband, John Craddock Maples, was a long-serving Conservative MP and was president of the Conservative Friends of Israel at the time of the attack on the Mavi Marmara. As well as making a video about this appallingly biased panorama program, I complained to the BBC, as did many others, and here is their finding. Not findings, you will note. At its meeting on 17th March 2011, the BBC's Editorial Standards Committee considered together appeals from 19 complainants in relation to death in the med. The consolidated appeal raised 51 points of issue, the committee upheld three of those points. No surprises there, and you can read the tedious 119-page whitewash by following the link I have included in this video's notes. 
but you will find no mention of the fact that the reporter correspondent of Death in the Med was married to the then chairman of conservative Friends of Israel. By any standards of moral or corporate ethics, this was plain wrong on two counts. First, for the BBC to send Jane Corbyn, the wife of the conservative chairman of Friends of Israel, to report on Israel's murderous attack on the Mavi Marmara was a breach of public trust. And what was the real agenda of some of those people who call themselves peace activists on board the Free Gaza flotilla? Second, failing to mention this fact in a subsequent report on issues raised by concerned members of the public was inexcusable. But one thing is certain, this whole episode has made a mockery of this phrase. BBC Trust. Now I have a confession to make. I have only just discovered these facts about the BBC's Editorial Standards Committee and they have rather thrown my original ideas on where this video was going. But it certainly points up the fact that people who hold public office cannot serve two masters at once, or mistresses I guess, at least not honestly. The rise of Zionist Jewish influence and power within the United States began in earnest with the establishment of IPAC in 1963, and today it virtually controls almost every facet of American politics. The bottom line is, if a US citizen is not prepared to demonstrate their allegiance to IPAC and Israel, then they might just scrape through if a ballot for municipal dog catcher was held, but they'd never get any further than that. And now, there is an increasing number of pro-apartheid Israel organizations that are eager to exercise the same kind of control in Europe. Of course, they don't mention the apartheid bit, but if you want a huge laugh, just look up the manifestos of some of these organizations. The European Friends of Israel seems to be based in Belgium, but it doesn't look as though any of its members have been to Israel. Otherwise, they might have left this off their website. We build too many walls and not enough bridges. Know what I mean? Its leader is someone named Michael Gure, and it is now the biggest organization of its kind in Europe, gathering 1,500 parliamentarians and policymakers who are friends of Israel. From the European Parliament, the 27 national parliaments of the European Union, and from 20 national parliaments of the Council of Europe. No wonder he looks so smug. But just listen to the vision statement. EFI draws its members together to increase understanding, to deepen the relationship between Europe and Israel, to expand and reinforce European support of Israel, and promote democracy, peace, and dialogue in the region. Give me a break. The large membership of your organization has to be the result of bribery or coercion. Just as it is in America and Britain, very few people can retain any kind of representative position in Europe unless they are prepared to turn a blind eye to the appalling way that Israel behaves towards the Palestinians and many of its neighbors, including right now helping to train foreign mercenaries to fight against Syria's legitimate government. So is there anything that we, the unchosen, can do about all this? Yes, there is. Unless, of course, you are an anything-goes kind of person who is content to let someone who condones this kind of thing represent you and the members of your family in the legislative body that will be determining yours and their futures. Therefore, not for God's sake or for Christ's sake, not in the name of Allah, but in the name of the beleaguered Palestinians and the Syrians and any other people that Israel is determined to dominate or crush, as well as for the sake of your own humanity, in the upcoming European parliamentary elections, do not vote for a friend of Israel.